Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Hilary Carr, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Shruti Swami presenting her debut short story collection, A House is a Body, joined in conversation with Megha Majumdar. Thank you for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtually, virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these unprecedented times. Every week we'll be hosting events here on our Zoom account. As always, our event schedule also appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. Tonight's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's New Voices in Fiction series, presented with Grub Street, highlighting debut authors discussing their work and the writing process. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase A House is a Body on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchase to and financial, excuse me, your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these past few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly and we do thank you for your patience and understanding. And so now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Shruti Swami is an award-winning writer and a Kundaman Fiction Fellow. Her work has appeared in the Paris Review, McSweeney's, and Prairie Schooner, among others. And she has held residencies at the Malay Colony for the Arts, Blue Mountain Center, and Hedgebrook, and was a Steinbeck Fellow at San Jose U State University and was Vassar College's 50th WK Rose Fellow. Tonight, Shruti will be joined by the New York Times bestselling author of A Burning, Megha Majumdar. These two will be discussing Shruti's debut collection, A House is a Body. The AV Club said of the book that Swami's words readily dazzle and the collection's themes, including a haunting exploration of sibling rivalry, reveal themselves gradually. Time also named A House is a Body one of their best new books of August, saying, throughout, Swami connects the narratives with her clean prose, punctuating moments both surreal and eerily realistic. We're so happy to have them both here tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Megha and Shruti. Thank you so much, Hilary, and hi, Shruti. Hi, Megha. Um, I'm so excited to help celebrate the launch of your beautiful book. Um, I'm just going to pluck it off my shelf so we can <laughs> do a close up. Um, a House as a Body is such a sophisticated, surprising book of short stories. I just tore through it and I felt so often that these are stories where after the last line, you just need to sit with what you read. Um, and I have been amazed by the range of stories in this book. I mean, you have stories which are completely realist. You have stories which are very surreal. They travel from India to the US to Germany. Um, so many of them are about immigrants, about motherhood and marriage and conflict and friction, um, about love and sex, ambition, forms of art and beauty, um, attention to beauty in ordinary moments like a snowfall and even in very difficult moments like a wildfire. And I will say that, um, a word that I kept coming back to as I was reading this book, a unifying quality felt like these stories are so much about aliveness. You know, what are the moments in which you feel alert to yourself and the people around you? So aliveness is something that I kept coming back to. Um, but how would you introduce this book to everybody watching? Oh my God, Mecca, that was so <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, that means so much to me. Thank you for saying that. Um, I actually don't know if I could, do, I could do it any better than what you just said. I do think that these stories to me are about very deeply about um, being alive and being alive in difficult times. Um, I wrote them in slightly less difficult times than the ones we're, we're living through right now. Um, but I feel like the seeds for the, this 
moment were in place when I was writing these stories and I was feeling, I was feeling the threads that have led to this in some ways in the, um, and was responding to them. So I think that many of these stories, this book is kind of asking the question, how do we make meaningful life through deep sorrow and also through joy? How do we, you know, how do we find those moments and honor them? And because that's what makes us human. Yeah. Um, there's a story here called The Laughter Artist where there's a really funny line which I, which I marked. It made me laugh and it goes something like this. It's um, two people talking to each other. They used to be married. They're not married anymore. And the line is, when we lived together, I assumed an anti-housework position that sprang from our collective confusion about what a wife was. <laughs> um, and the book is so interested in these roles, you know, and in these moments of transition, um, being a couple, being married, becoming a mother. What draws your interest to these roles and these instances of transition? Hmm. Um, well, I, I think that there's a lot that have been, I mean, I think especially like the role of a wife or a mother has been written about a lot in really restrictive ways, or ha we have a really restrictive still understanding about um, what those roles might mean as a, as a daughter, as a lover, all of these roles when it comes to the roles that women are put into. Um, we don't have a full, like, we don't have a very culturally nuanced understanding of, of what they are when we think about it um, broadly. And I was interested in inhabiting those and, and um, you know, and sometimes being like, what does it mean to be really bad? What does it mean to be bad in these roles? You know, what does it mean to really fuck up as a mom? Or, um, you know, it was actually rereading. I wrote um, a a House is a Body, the title story, uh, before I, I was a mother and was actually recently rereading it. That is an example of a very bad, a, a mother in a very bad moment of being a mother. Um, and I was very stressed out <laughs> by it as a mother. Now where I was like, oh my God, your child is so sick. You've got to do something. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I was like, I mean, just like that character in The Laughter Artist who's like, okay, well, I'm rejecting this idea of what a wife is, but then like, what is it? And I think a lot of it, even just personally, I think that there's a lot of cultural ideas, like received cultural ideas that I was like, I don't agree with that anymore. But then it's like, you're starting, sort of starting from scratch to build, um, to build what you, you want to believe in. And it can be kind of um, confusing and strange. So I think that there were some ways in which I was using my fiction to explore that. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up the title story because it feels spookily similar to or like some kind of other image of what you are experiencing right now in California. Mm -hmm. Was it was it eerie rereading that story for, for those who haven't picked up the book yet? The title story is about a mother and a child who um, are in this house while a wildfire gets closer and closer. Yeah, yeah. I actually can't read it right now because it's um, that I grew up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And um, over the years, there had been many, even as I was growing up, um, I don't think anybody has ever seen. I mean, I just read an article today that fire scientists are like, I have never seen anything like what's happening in California right now. It's like completely... Mm -hmm unprecedented and the scale of it, but um, grew up with, with that feeling of, of danger coming and, you know, just the, just the slightest turn of the wind can just change your life. You know, the fire moves yeah. so quickly and so unpredictably. Um, so unfortunately it gets like, I wrote that story in 2015 and it, it keeps being more and more relevant and, and unfortunately will be more and more relevant because um, this is really a fact of life for us Californians now. Um, but uh, yeah, it sucks that it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, one element of the book that I was really struck by is the book pays such close and interesting attention to religion and, and the divine and myths 
And there's one story in which this is at the forefront. It's a story called Earthly Pleasures, in which the god Krishna um, appears as a kind of celebrity at a party. Um, tell us about your interest in reimagining or thinking about the divine. Mm. Um, well, that story in particular came about, um, I had, there was this incredible series of photographs by an Indian photographer that was um, visualizing Krishna in particular in these like very modern settings. They're like these hyper-saturated um, pictures of him and I think that that stuck in my mind because Krishna was the one I was always the most familiar with and felt as a child, I felt like I grew up listening to so many stories about Krishna that he um, felt like kind of a friend to me. Um, he's so approachable, you know, and he's like, he's like always getting into mischief. And yeah. <laughs> he's so like, I feel like he would be, he's like very charismatic and friendly and he's Arjun's friend. Um, so that was, I think that that just like that familiarity, I just wanted to spend some time with him <laughs> in that story, that story. There's some stories in there that I was like, oh, I'll just write this for fun and nobody will read this. It's just like for me, this weird fun thing. And then, um, and then following it at some point I would follow it and be like, oh, okay, actually this is a real story that I'm interested in. I can see that I was interested in something. But for me writing that story, it was just like, oh, what would it be like if Krishna was a celebrity? <laughs> that, that would be so interesting. Um, yeah, but the divine more broadly, I think that I just, um, I don't know, I, I, I think that there's a way in which um, like the, the real life, like the physical objects of real life and the mundaneness of real life is not enough for me. I don't think it, if I was just only looking at that part of people doing their jobs and eating their lunches, and like, you know, putting their kids to bed, I would be missing something, even if it's not literally in our lives. Um, I mean, I guess I'm saying like, whether or not you have religion or spirituality in your life, to me, it feels like there's some element of like mystery and awe that would, would be absent if I didn't, if I omitted it from these stories. So I don't think I was purposely, I mean, there just be, it was there, those were the things that were there when I reached for them. But I think it's because there's something so profoundly amazing about being alive, so unspeakably amazing about being alive. And, um, and I needed ways to express that just beyond like, you know, moments. And some, sometimes those moments are expressed in quiet moments of wonder. And sometimes they're expressed by like the, the divine. That, that, felt really, um, that felt really important to me, I think, to, to have that element. Yeah. Um... I apologize if you can hear sirens in my neighborhood. They'll be over in a minute. But um, I, I did really love how this attention to sacredness kind of flows outward from ideas of God and the divine and into moments like walking or, you know, observing nighttime and just kind of seeps into so much else in the book. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, Let's talk about a different story. One of my favorite stories here is The Neighbors, mm -hmm. in which um, two women who are new neighbors, um, I'm not going to give anything away, but they approach a moment of vulnerability, of sharing a piece of explosive knowledge. Tell us about how that story grew. Mm. How did that story grow? Um, I don't, <laughs> I wrote that story so long ago. I, or maybe I wrote that story in like 2011. And, um, what, I think that one, the thing that I was really interested in, there's no men in that story, although there's no men literally in the story. There's men who figure very, their, their actions and their presence should be felt in the story, but they're never on stage. Um, and I had this feeling like I wanted to write a story where I was able to express that there would be something at the center of it that would never come into vision, but that would be, would put a lot of pressure on the story. Mm. Um, 
And so I was interested. I mean, I think it's really interesting with short stories because I think you are taught to withhold and like the release of information is really like, as opposed to a novel, I think the release of information is like, and the way that you calibrate that is like really um, a huge part of what you're doing when you're writing a story. And, um, and I've been lately a little bit suspicious about that in that like, or just this feeling of like the tightness of control and the control over like emotion um, in stories and, and what is expressed and what isn't expressed. And it's like, why can't we just say emotion plainly? Like what's wrong with that? <laughs> Um, but in this case, I think that there is, this is a story about something that um, sometimes when we go through trauma, it's not like we're being coy, you know, by not speaking it. It's because we don't have language. There's some things that we don't actually have language for. And this happens a few times in this collection where th that people go through something that is very traumatic for them. And they don't, it's not like they're just being like, oh, like, I'm not going to tell you, you know, they're not withholding for the sake of withholding. It's because there is no language to express that kind of trauma, that they don't have that language maybe culturally available to them in particular, or even more generally. Sometimes things happen to us that we just don't have words for or names for, um, that have a profound effect on the ways that we live our lives and we see ourselves. And, and some of those stories are, are about that. That, and especially the neighbors, I think, is about that. That definitely makes me think about how the book often circles these kind of huge points of orientation, like death and grief and sex, and often puts them in really rich and surprising conversation. Um, it sounds like that was part of your project a little bit to like get as close to those moments of of um what we don't have language for with language mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely i think so <laughs> and i i mean i think that there's a part of this that i felt like you know we use the word unspeakable um in really ter you know when we're when there's been a, a terrible tragedy we say it's an unspeakable thing and and so it was an important part of this project for me to speak it, to imagine yeah. it, to name it, to give that space in, in, like, in our imaginations and to hold that because these are still real experiences just because like sometimes, I mean, I think that when we say things are unspeakable, it like shuts us off from, from being able to hold space with the people who have experienced that or maybe one day we will experience that, God mm -hmm. forbid. And then we can't, we can't be in a moment where it's unspeakable to ourselves, you know? So, um, as much as even if not, the characters aren't always able to name that or give language to it, I wanted these experiences, some of them really difficult to be present and to be, um, to be grappled with, because I think it's really important to have uh, stories that do that. Yeah. Let's talk about the complete opposite of that. Um, forms of expression, um, art, so painters and musicians, show up several times in this collection. Can I ask, what is it about these artists that um, makes them interesting characters for you to write? Um, yeah, I'm wondering, because I, I know that you have an actor in your book, your beautiful <laughs> book of burning. Um, and I wonder if this is similar for you. I sometimes just feel like so much envy for other forms of art. You know, it's maybe it's like a little bit of a grass is always greener situation. like dancers don't have to use language so they don't even have to put things into words i don't even know if there's a dancer my my novel that i'm working on right now is about a dancer um mm -hmm. but you know there's like a way where language is so limiting and you are as a writer like every day coming up against the limits of language and that's your job is to come up with come up against the limits of language and try and push them out a little bit further um so it can be so liberating like an actor, like the laughter artist, she starts as a failed actor and then she becomes this imagined profession of laughter artist. Um, you know, something that's so physical or um, somebody like painting and like the technical skill of painting. There's something like so untechnical about writing in some ways, you know what I mean? Like that you don't like practice your scales the way you would with a, if you're a violinist <laughs> or something, <laughs> keep your fingers really limber. So I think I, you know, in a, in a way, 
where um, if I actually was one of those things, I'd be like, oh yeah, but then you have to like contend with this really hard thing. I'm sure there's like lots of really hard things about, you know, but there's one time where I was at a, write, I was at a residency where I was with um, a couple of visual artists and it was so interesting to watch them work and how different it was for me. For me, it would be like, I would write for like three hours a day and I'd be like, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so intense for me. You know, you can get so much done in three yeah. hours if you're really focused. And they would be up the whole night, you know, listening to music or podcasts and like making their work, which was so physical. Um, and we were both making art. And I just, I, I guess that it was just, um, so I'm giving, I'm offering myself just a tiny little bit of that when I <laughs> let my characters be other kinds of artists. Yeah. I really love that. But at the same time, while you're talking about language, I feel like one of the things that I really admire in this book, and there are so many things, but one of them is um, the dialogue. Mm. Um, it is so full of life. It is so layered. Sometimes it is sly. And it's really just a pleasure to read people talking to each other in this book. Um, what is your process for writing dialogue? Uh, thank you, my God, that's, that's another very kind thing to say. Um, my process, I don't know, sometimes, I, I mean, I do think a long time ago when I was in college, I had a writing teacher who made me, um, made all of us, this was an assignment in class, was to go and just go into a public place and sit and eavesdrop on people and, and actually write down verbatim their, their conversation. And what he, his point was, is he was like, when you look at dialogue, that's so like, when you write dialogue, your tendency is to get yeah, everybody goes straight to the point. You know, everybody understands each other perfectly. It's very linear. There's an arc. And when people are actually talking to each other, I mean, my cat's being, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to shut my cat in the pantry, but then I forgot. So now she's here. Um, <laughs> It, you know, but when you're actually listening to people talk, there's so much um, miscommunication, evasion, ums and likes, and um, and the 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 conversation is not narrow, like linear. It's very um, you know, it's very you know, somebody will lose a train of thought, bring something else random. So that was actually that created a you know forever more. Am I always listening to people's conversations? Sorry, but you're having it in public, so. <laughs> That's on you. <laughs> no, I love that. And like, I love that shape of like people leaving things out when they talk like one line, very tiny line from a story is um, two people talking and they're talking about, you know, whether they would choose to go to the moon or Mars, I think. I'm sorry if I'm misremembering. Mm -hmm. no, that's Shruti, exactly but, right. But the, but the line is Mars, you don't come back. Like that is the full sentence is mm -hmm. Mars, you don't come back. And like, mm -hmm. that is how people talk, but that would be, I can imagine that it takes so much thoughtfulness and finessing to get to the point where that is what you write instead of writing from Mars, you never come back or something like that, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I just love, and I think that that's one of the things I miss so much about. Um, I mean, I, I guess now we are all back on the streets and I can, and people are, are around and I can hear them talk, but just listening to people talk is just like an enduring pleasure in my life. I just love, it's so amazing to me. I mean, like I miss going on the bus so much because there's so many stories that are happening right in front of you. If you're just paying attention and just being like narratively what's happening. Um, yeah. I miss that so much. And I, I wonder like, yeah, for me, I just feel like I hear those voices pretty clearly when I'm writing, if I'm like kind of in the flow and the diction comes to me pretty, just like I hear it. Is that, do you have that experience too? Or do you feel like you like um, have to like, do you know what I mean? Do you just hear that or how, because your voices too, I feel like are so distinct and specific. How it's very generous, Shruti. <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's some work that I have to do to get to the place where um, a character or a scene finds its register. Mm -hmm. And once you find the register, then you, it's, it's a bit like tuning like a radio dial a little bit. Like once you mm -hmm. find the right station and you've like locked into it, then you can keep writing in that voice. But it does, mm -hmm. it definitely takes me work to get to that place. So I am yeah. not natural like I just hear it kind of person. Yeah, but I think that's the same thing that I'm saying. <laughs> I think that it, it takes me a little while too. And then sometimes I'll be like the story, 
has a first sentence or something and you'd be like, oh, okay, I understand where I'm going. And then sometimes it will yeah. just take a longer time to get into the voice. But once I'm in there, it takes me a while to get into the voice too. It's only once yeah. I'm in there. Um, so it sounds like you've been writing these stories over quite a long duration. Can you talk about the process of building this collection? And at what point did you know you had a collection? Um, yeah, this collection has been the earliest story I wrote in like 2008. Um, so it's been uh, a, a long, uh, long process of putting this collection together. Um, and I, th I thought at many different points I had. <laughs> <laughs> I had a collection and then it turns out that I had a better collection coming, but <laughs> I didn't know it yet. Um, I, uh, I think one of the things that was interesting about putting together this book is that um, was actually seeing all of the points of resonance that there were, that there were things that there definitely, I didn't necessarily, I did set out to write a book by writing stories, but I didn't set out to write a particular like book about X, you know, um, so the way that they came together was quite organic and just came out of my own, you know, obsessions and, um, and hopefully also just my, pers my voice, my perspective and my, um, the, the way that the, the, the words sound um, in when you're reading them, that felt like more of a cohesive um, thing than I thought it might when I, when I actually wound up putting things together. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm going to remind everybody watching that we will have time for your questions in a bit. So please drop them into the Q&A button at the, at the bottom of your screen and we will get to them soon. Um, I want to talk about another of my favorite stories here, which is called Wedding Season. And it's a story in which um, a couple travel to India and face, I'm trying, and face this like heartbreaking truth about their own lives. Um, can you tell us about writing that story? Because I'm also interested, I'm interested in like the ideas here and how you landed upon this like wedding story, mm -hmm. but also completely subverted it. Hmm. Um, I just had gone to India. <laughs> I had just gone to India and I, um, you know, the story isn't like about me autobiographically, but I think that in some ways the story is um, me trying to come to terms with um, my disconnection from India, my longing to belong to a place um, that I, you know, I didn't grow up in. I visited many times as a child and, and less frequently as a young adult and as an adult. Um, and I don't speak any Indian languages. Um, so there was a, a real feeling when I go to India, and I remember going to India when I was um, maybe 13 or 14 and, um, and crying. Cause I was like, I thought I would feel at home here. Like I was always like, okay, America doesn't seem to necessarily see me or want me, but in India, like people will have a framework for understanding me. Mm -hmm. And then going to India at that time as a, as a, like a very young teenager and being like, oh no, <laughs> I'm just as weird here. <laughs> I'm even, I'm unintelligible in different ways here than I am in America. Um, and, and coming to terms with that and, and, and then trying to move beyond that. I think that when I, when I've traveled as an adult, I've gone without my family. Um, I've gone with my husband who's white and that's also been a really different experience um, and, you know, some of that is like, you know, I, I have, um, so some of that is like, if you can move through that, what's on the other side of it. And some of that is just like, yeah, there's just always going to be this longing there. And I wanted to write a story about that longing. Cause I feel like I spent a lot of time when I was a really, when I was a child in America, rejecting Indian culture. I was like embarrassed by, it. I was like embarrassed by my lunches. Everybody was always making fun of like my lunches and like my name was so hard to pronounce and all the mm -hmm. stuff that I just rejected a lot of it. And then, and that was a kind of violence that I didn't realize that I was doing to myself. And so now I, as an adult, some things have been severed and some things still remain. And, and one of the things that remains is that longing. And um, so, so many of these stories are either explicitly about that longing or just like a hand that I'm reaching out to um, my 
uh, my cultures there, my family there, um, my the religions that I was great, the religion that I was, um, gr I grew up around the mythology of all of those things to just not as like a definitive version of any of those things, but almost like a question to those posed to those things. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's really beautiful. Thinking of these stories as like gestures and approaches and invitations. I really, I really love that. Um, so I realized that I've been talking about a couple of my favorite stories here, but do you have a favorite or do you have one that, that um, is really special to you for some reason? Um, oh, they're all special to me, my sweet little <laughs> stories out in the world. Um, <laughs> Is there anyone in particular that I always, I would say um, Earthly Pleasures is one that I just, for the sheer pleasure of writing it, I, um, but all of them in their own way really offered something to me and I feel grateful to them for that. I don't know yeah. if I can think of anyone at the moment. Um, I love you all. <laughs> um, I just saw that we do have a specific question about Earthly pleasures. Oh, great. So maybe we can jump into that one. Yeah, that sounds um, great. It's from BT Hung and they say, um, I found the story incredibly original, creative, and interesting. Could you talk a little bit about how it came to be? Any inspirations, changes, or revisions you made that yielded unexpected moments in the story? Um, hi, VT. Thanks for coming. Thanks for that question. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, Earthly Pleasure is one of the reasons that it, um, that I love it so much. It, like, I feel such a soft spot in my heart for it is because I had a really interesting process of writing it. And then I was just like, oh, I'm just going to try out this little Krishna thing. Like, what if Krishna was a celebrity? And then I was like, oh, okay, who's this person? She's an alcoholic painter. Like, what's her deal? And then I just started following the story and it became this like bigger and bigger story that I, uh, I mean, just like longer story than I was ever anticipating. Usually when I write a story, I find it so intimidating to like, be like, I have to write a whole story. I'll be like, it can just be two pages and that can be the story. <laughs> like I always tell myself that. Um, so it's just like following the story. And then it had enough momentum and energy that I was like, okay, it definitely is a story and it wants to be a story, but what happens? And I think it was the moment where she um, goes to the grocery store. It was right before that. I was like, what happens now? And I just sat there and I wrote in my notebook, what happens, what happens, what happens? And then I was like, oh, she goes to the grocery store and she sees like somebody who she thinks Corey is there. Um, and that, that experience was really like actually sort of changed my writing process because after that, I, I just felt like, once you get to a certain level with the story, you can sort of trust for it to keep happening. And you can just sit there in the discomfort of writing the story and not knowing. And your brain, I mean, I think this is also like maybe neuroscientifically true that our brains are so hardwired to make patterns and stories that if you just sit there in that uncomfortable moment, I think something, your brain will just let it happen. Um, so I don't even actually that is so fully remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> they answered it. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I think it's true. <laughs> but you know, some um, of these stories took like a really long time, like a simple composition. I wrote many, many drafts and like, you know, years before I wrote that draft. And then I just put them in a drawer and I was like, this is really not working. And then, you know, years after that, I pull, I didn't even pull those drafts out, but I was just like, I'm starting again from this different point. And then it became this other story, which I wrote very quickly. I wrote it in like a week or something. Um, and I didn't actually revise that one that much. And so you would see that and be like, whoa, that's crazy that that only took a week. That's so quick. But that was actually like, you know, five or seven years of work or, you know, of, of moving of my mind, moving it around. So sometimes it just takes a while, but if you wait, it'll come, I think. I love that. Very encouraging. <laughs> um, we have a question from Catherine Epstein who asks, as I read through this breathtaking collection, um, oh, as I read through this breathtaking collection, I notice a pattern of characters in confinement. Sometimes it's imposed by others. Sometimes it seems to be self-confinement. Also made me think about houses and bodies as sites of both liberation and confinement. Do you see confinement as a pattern 
in the collection? And do you think it was conscious or not as you wrote? Uh, hello, Catherine Epstein. That's my best friend. That's Catherine Epstein. Oh. <laughs> hello, Catherine Epstein. <laughs> Uh, hi, Catherine. Um, it, no, it definitely wasn't conscious. That's really interesting that you're picking up on that. It's totally true. And I feel like a simple composition, maybe in particular, I remember feeling um, the sense like she's in exile. I mean, I guess that's different than confinement. I had the sense like I was writing about somebody who was in exile from herself, um, from her own body and even her own like um, autonomy or consciousness. Um, but yeah, that, con that confinement, I never really considered it before, but it's true. I, I think right now it also makes me think of how I'm starting to think of confinement in certain ways, maybe technically as sort of liberating, that there's so much creatively that can come from a, um, and you know, we're all <laughs> very confined right now. <laughs> um, and one way that I've been trying to make meaning out of that is being like, what is possible right now in this house, <laughs> you know, like literally in this house, because I can't leave because it's so smoky outside. <laughs> what is possible? And so I think that like some, I think that confinement is really a negative thing in many of these, like I think that many of these women in particular are struggling with the confinements of their of expectations about them or, um, or things that they're not allowed to do or, or dreams they're not, they're not feeling like they're, they're able to pursue or achieve. Um, but I also wonder if some of it, it's like that confinement can also be a create, like it can be a source of creativity or creative, a place of, of creative action. Yeah. Wait, now I have to ask, what has the pandemic and, and now the wildfires and staying at home so much, has that changed how you write or has it changed what kind of art you make or consume? Um, yeah, I mean, it definitely like physically, literally has changed the way that I write where I have this like teeny tiny little desk in my <laughs> bedroom, which is now where I uh, write, which I didn't, I, I went other places to do that before. And that's been <laughs> a little bit challenging. I don't know. I think it's still too early. I'm, I'm really curious what's going to come out of this for all of us. And, and it's hard right now, I think, um, personally with the wildfires and, um, being so close to the election and all the stuff that you guys all know is going on. It's been feeling kind of bleak for me. I've been feeling like, um, I don't know what's on the other side of this, but I think that if I were able to, I've just been feeling a lot of grief, especially in the last few days, I've just been feeling like a true sense of grief. And I, I want to allow myself to feel that grief before I, um, before I, you know, bef as it needs to be felt, I need to like honor that and then, and then see what's on the other side of it. But I, I wonder if the answer is like, there's a kind of curiosity that I have too. It's like, what is going to happen? It's true that, that a lot of um, creativity and innovation comes from artistically and otherwise comes from these great moments of constraint or confinement. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting in like on a cultural level and also personally, but just like motherhood, I feel like motherhood, I became a mother two years ago and, um, I'm still, I'm just sort of right now starting to feel like I am a mother. And mm. I was, I was like waiting for this like dramatic, like, Oh, it's like lightning down me or something where it's like, this was the before and this was the after in my writing, you know, or I could just tell like, Oh, it's like reshaped my brain completely. Like all the studies said, <laughs> and I think it's been a much more subtle and gradual change that I might, I don't know if it will, it will be something so dramatic, but I do think that this is a in very intense time that all of us are going through and that it's true that it's not just sorrow and loss that can be on the other side of it. There can also be just new ways of thinking and seeing and being that, um, that can be a source of hope for us, for those of us who are feeling really quite bleak about things right now. Yeah. I mean, I know that there has been some like dismissal of pandemic novels and that kind of thing, but I personally am pretty excited to see what comes out of this in the next like five years or 10 years as people process it and sit with it, like what kind of art will we start to see? What concerns? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm really curious. Is that, has, have you felt any changes in your own writing or the, like the way you're putting language together or the things you're gravitating towards since the pandemic started? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think like we were just talking about before the event started, Shruti, I think that 
there has been a lot of pressure, this expectation that like, oh, now we're all at home. We have tons of time. We're finally going to make the like magnificent art that we always knew we could make, you know? But like, I feel like the discipline of sitting down every day to write, that discipline still takes work and it's still slow. And I think what has maybe changed in this period is that I have more compassion for, for when it's hard. I understand mm -hmm. why it's hard because you, you know, you read the news and you, and you see what's happening and it feels okay that it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that way too. I also feel like when I'm, I did write like a lot of my, or I did a pretty major revision of my novel in the first month of the pandemic. And it was just like, really nice to not have any like to be working on something that had like nothing to do with the pandemic and be really immersed like it was a really it was a way to give myself a ref it can be a refuge I think just having a writing practice right now yeah for sure um that segues really nicely into a question from Nina Pinocchio who says, um, can't wait to read this collection. Can you talk a little about the difference in your writing process when working on a short story versus a longer form like a novel? Yeah, they're really, really different for me. I feel like each novel, I've written two novels, but only one of them. The first novel um, was like a first pancake novel, which I was like, oh, how do you, how do novels work? What do you, what do you do with novels? Um, which actually was really thrilling. So I have to say that I have written a lot of short stories and I have spent a lot of time working on that craft. And there's something that when I worked on that first novel and even the second novel, because they're really different, um, that they, it was really thrilling to be a novice again at something where I'm just like, I mechanically have no idea how to sustain a story for this long. And I have to just teach myself how to do that, that that allowed me to take a lot of creative risks that I just, I think I've like talked myself out of it. And you can see like in Blindness, Blindness is the first story I wrote. I was just thinking about this the other day that Blindness is the first story, like the oldest story in the collection. And it's actually formally the most daring by far out of all of them. And I think I almost know more now about, about writing a short story I would have talked myself out of it, sort of. Like, I don't know if I, I would allow myself to take the same risks anymore because I just like feel more comfortable in the mechanics of the story and driving it forward. Um, so for me, there's, in both the, the, both the times I've written a novel, they've been um, really wonderful, like just be starting from scratch again. And also that process of, um, just pushing something slowly. I mean, that's similar to a story too. Sometimes you're just pushing and pushing and pushing, but it's, it has a different feeling when you're like creating, you're pushing such a big thing. It's like maybe making a snowball. I don't live in a snowy climate. It's like maybe making a snowball <laughs> and it keeps getting bigger and bigger as you gather it. And that process can be really pleasurable because you're not, you're never just like, oh no, what do I work on now? I'm so fallow. You're like, oh yeah, I just keep working on this novel forever until I die. No problem. <laughs> um, too true. Um, here's a question from Rina Shah who asks, did you come up against resistance in the publishing industry about stories of or about immigrants? Hmm. I mean, not that I know of, like nobody ever has to tell you why they have rejected <laughs> your work. So, um, I, I don't think I have, um, you know, you never know why. And I think that that has been, um, in the beginning and there's times that I've wondered if the stories that got the most rewarded were because they aligned more neatly with the, uh, a narrative that already existed about Indian women um, and the ones that were rejected more or um, didn't, didn't find a home as easily were because they were just like pushing against those narratives more than the other stories. Um, but I have no way of knowing. So, I mean, I think that's like, unfortunately the condition of being a woman of color is like, you just never know why. And you're always like, are they being racist? Am I just not a good writer? Like you just don't, you just don't know. So, I mean, ultimately, no, in terms of like, here's this, co this collection, it exists. Like sometimes I feel like against all odds, <laughs> here it is in the world. Um, and I do think that the publishing industry is much more expansive um, 
in terms of what, uh, I think there's a lot of incredible fiction and lots of different voices that are being published more than ever before. Um, so I think there's a lot of room, um, but you'll never know, you'll just never know and you just have to keep trying anyways. Mm. Um, we have a question from KG Vane, who is my friend. Is she also your friend? I don't no, think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you my friend, um, Katie? We're all friends. <laughs> um, Katie says, as a fellow Vassar grad, I'm curious to know what you took away from your creative writing classes there. Are there lessons you still draw from? And maybe, maybe we can, because I was going to ask you something that kind of plugs into this is, you know, advice or lessons that you learned early on that you would like to share for the other writers in the room? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, Vassar, did I learn, what did I learn at Vassar? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think uh, I, Oh, geez. You know, it's like 15 years ago. Some stuff was pretty, pr like, I mean, it was very foundational just in general, um, being able to take these really wonderful writing classes. I think the thing that really jumps out at me when I think of it is um, being in a class with K.S.A. Lehman, who was like truly one of the only writers of color that I ever took a class with, like most of my instructors. And that was something I wasn't super conscious of when I, like definitely not an undergrad and even when I was in grad school, that is a consideration that I would have made for myself if I had known, if I had been more conscious of it at that point, I would have thought about that a little bit more. Um, because it really makes a difference when you are in a room or in a space that's really white, either like the, the, the conversation's really different about your work if you're not writing about white stuff, <laughs> I guess. So um, KSA had, had just, and I was really writing only stories about white people and KSA said, why are you writing stories about white people? Why don't you write about like Indian people, for example? And I was like, ah, I can't do that. And he was like, that's ridiculous, why not? And then I did. And he, I think he saved me like, you know, years of work because um, I would have probably gone there eventually, but it might've taken me a lot longer. Um, and, uh, it, more generally advice for writers, I, um, you know, I just think that a lot of people gave me a lot of advice and it was all great advice and you just, you know, it, it didn't, I didn't register it at all because it, <laughs> you just have to learn it for yourself. It's like really hard. Everything about this is like hard and, um, and then you'll just do it because you love it and you'll keep learning things and the stuff that's hard that will, will be hard, but they're not insurmountable. And if you just keep, keep working on your stuff, you're going to get better. I think that that is something maybe I didn't really totally understand. And I didn't necessarily have faith in, which is like, you actually can get better. <laughs> like if you keep doing it, you will get better. Right. Um, that's like pretty obvious, but I, it was something that I definitely, and that's like, I think that's a problem with advice is it's like, yeah, like it's hard. <laughs> you know, or, I mean, maybe one really good piece of advice that I received from my uh, their best friend, Shama Gallagher. I have three best friends. The third one might also be on this call, Chris Green. <laughs> You're also my best friend. Um, Shama Gallagher, who's a poet and an essayist. And she told me that, um, she told me my, about my dialogue. She said uh, that I think your characters understand each other too well. And that is actually a really profound piece of advice for me because it feels like when um, characters are talking to each other, they sometimes like when, when people are talking to each other, they don't necessarily know what they're communicating to the other person. Sometimes they don't know what their motives are. Sometimes they're lying to the other person or the person's lying to them or mm -hmm. they're lying to themselves about their motivations or they're just not focused or whatever it is that people rarely have that kind of straight across linear conversation that they're talking past each other. And those, and actually the gaps between the communication is just as interesting, even more interesting and the point of dialogue. Um, as it is the moments where they do understand each other. So that's something, and I even think you can pull it out further, which is like, sometimes if your characters understand themselves too much, like you have to be able to understand them. But if they understand themselves too much, um, you might, it might just feel like you're driving, you know, then you, you're driving the story as opposed to letting them be people. Right. And I'm cautious of that when I'm, when I'm writing. I love how you were like, no advice, don't believe in advice. <laughs> yeah. And then here's two excellent pieces of advice. 
<laughs> well done, Shruti. Um, did you just say that your other best friend is Chris Freeman? I did. Okay. <laughs> have a question. <laughs> we have a question from them. Do you ever feel as though the boundary between writing for yourself and writing for an audience that is journaling versus fiction gets blurred? Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question, Chris, particularly right now, because um, you know, I wrote all of these stories with this like nebulous audience in mind, but never wrote them being like, I don't want anybody ever to read these. These are my private thoughts and feelings. Like I wrote them with an audience in mind, sort of. But it's really different than having a book in the world and people actually reading it. And that's really changed even just like, I, I mean, it's like still fairly abstract and like, I'm not like out in the world and I'm like watching all these people reading my book. But even just that feeling of knowing that people are listening to me has really affected the way that I'm thinking about myself when I'm sitting down to write um, in ways that are probably... I would like to actually unfeel some of that because I feel like it is making me feel weird. <laughs> but I do think that, um, yeah, sometimes I write in my journal in ways where I just want to describe myself, my life to myself as I would write a story about it to make my life like intelligible and beautiful to myself. And then there's also some pieces of writing like essays or stories where I, I tell myself, nobody ever has to see this. Um, you're just writing it because you're interested in it. And it doesn't have to be a real story. So there is a lot of blurring in, in the ways that I, um, and in the ways in like the modes that I write. Um, hmm. sure. yeah. Have you felt like your writing practice has changed since you've published your novel? Like you felt your audience more and that's affected you? Um, you know, I feel like I've let it affect me only when it's a hard writing day and I'm really struggling with a section or a page and um, I try to let it be fuel, you know, and just let it be like, oh, here's, you know, a critic or a reader who has faith in me, like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and there is, there has been so much encouragement and lifting up and I try to take that as, as energy and fuel. But other than that, I feel like when I, when I sit down, it's just me mm -hmm. facing my failures on the page. And in that solitary space, I only can rely on my own intuitions. I can only mm -hmm. see if sentences ring true to me or not. So mm -hmm. it's still a very solitary space for which I'm grateful. Um, we have two questions from Marisa Kutz, which, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Marisa, but I'll try to I'll try to put them together. So can you describe your working experience with your editor at Algonquin? And also, you know, if you were working with white editors or like other white professionals, or did you ever feel like you had to do explaining? Were there moments of, um, you know, difficulty in understanding the vision for your book or anything like mm -hmm. that? How did you navigate that? Um, yeah, I think I got really lucky both with my agent, Samantha Shea, and with my editor, um, Betsy Glick. She, it's G-L-E-I-C-K, and I asked her how to say it, and then I forgot. I think it's Glick, <laughs> Betsy Glick. Um, both of them uh, are white um, and have definitely, in different points in, in both my novel and in the story collection, been like, this doesn't totally make sense to me. Um, and we've had conversations that have specifically been around cultural stuff in the book, but ultimately both of them, like I've I felt a lot of trust from them where I'm like, I, it's really important to me as a, as a writer to not explain a bunch of stuff. Like I don't want, I put, there's a lot of c cultural stuff um, in this book and also in my novel that I just didn't want to like explain. I, I wanted it to be, it embedded enough that you could just get it through context or you could just like Google it or something. And, and um, that it wouldn't be that I would be like you, my imagined audience who's, who is not Indian or who is maybe just white, like, don't worry, I got you. Like, I'm going to tell you all about this stuff. I wanted everybody to be in my experience and in my consciousness. So there was not a lot of explaining and some stuff I, so I did have some conversations with Betsy where she'd be like, I just really 
don't get this. And it was, that's really helpful because you want to know what people don't get if they're not, I mean, spe specifically if they're not Indian, um, what is just like not registering. And sometimes that would be even like dramatically it'd be like, I don't understand the scene because I don't understand why they're so upset. And then it'd be like, okay, I, I need to like change something so that that the emotion of that scene comes across. Um, but I, I feel really lucky that I, I, every time I was like, no, it's important for me to just have it like that. Um, they, both of them were, were always like, okay, great. Then it's like that. That's great. So I felt like a lot of uh, trust from them, which was really, I've had a very good experience working with yeah. both of them. Amazing. Um, I think we are nearing the end of our event. So I'm going to wrap up with one last question. I saw a couple questions um, asking for reading recommendations. What have you loved? What are you reading now? What would you like to recommend? Mm, um, right now, I am reading, um, well, I'm reading this book, White Dancing Elephants by Chaya, Chaya Bhuvaneshwar. Um, which is, it actually came out a couple years ago. There's just like, I don't know if you've noticed this, Mecca, there's like a bunch of short story collections by Indian women that have come out or just like about to come out or coming out right now. And I find that like so thrilling. It's like really, I feel like I'm in this like amazing, I don't know if, how they feel about being grouped into this group that I'm making them <laughs> in right now, but there's this book, White Dancing Elephants. There's a book called Smoke Sugar Song um, by Rima um, Rajbanshi, I think. Um, that's coming out in like a week. There's a book called Each of Us Killers by Jenny Bott that's coming out in a few weeks too. Um, there's this short story writer who's really amazing named Vandana Singh, who is a science fiction, Indian science fiction short story writer. And I just feel like, you know, who would 20 year old Shruti have imagined this like moment that it's like, I published, like, I just had Jimple here, you know what I mean? And that's <laughs> less, but also, like, that's a lot to just have one person who's, like, your entire you know, cultural representation. There's now just so many voices in the medium of the short story, um, and they're all so different. It's just, it's quite thrilling, I think. Yeah, what are you reading, Mecca? I asked you already, and then I actually forgot. <laughs> so you can tell um, me again. I have a bunch of recommendations, but I'll just do one. Um, I really loved The Death of Vivek Oji by Akweke Maisi, which is a novel that I just came out. Definitely. It is so good. I really loved it. There's a character I, named Kavita in it, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I thought of your, I thought of your kid when I read it. Yeah, that. my daughter's name is Kavita. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you everyone so much. Everybody go buy A House is a Body from Harvard Bookstore right now. It's a tremendous collection. Um, thank you, Shruti. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you everybody at Harvard Bookstore. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Hillary. This was really wonderful. Really, thank you both. This was, this was so lovely. Um, thank you to Shruti and Megha. Thank you to all of you out there spending your evening with us. You can learn more about this book and purchase A House as a Body at harvard.com after uh, this closes down. Um, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night, keep reading, and everybody really please be well. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.